Amen. So we are continuing our study through the book of Luke. Uh, it's an interesting section here. Uh, one of the things that I learned in seminary was, you know, the true strength of Jesus. I probably have shared it before, but when before I went to seminary, I always when I thought of Jesus, I always saw I always saw him and pictured him like, you know, like I saw him uh, as I grew up watching the movie, you know, and he was gentle and calm and he spoke in, in such a nice old voice and I always pictured him, you know. And, and then I, I really started studying scripture and I realized that he had such a strong character. And as much as he could be gentle and kind and compassionate and loving, man, he also could be strong and, and hard and upfront and decisive. This is one of those sections. If, if you recall, last week when we saw him, he had done this miracle. This man that was mute, this demon in him had, had kept him from speaking for years and years and years. And they bring him to Jesus, and Jesus immediately releases him from this demon, and the man is able to speak. And the people there, well, half of them, half of them begin to criticize, right? So half of them look at this and say, well, he... he he did that through the power of Satan. To which Jesus says, boy, did you really think about what you just said? Did you really think this through before you said it? How can Satan cast out Satan? How can a house that's divided stand? It, it, it cannot. What's the point of Satan defeating Satan? It's not going to happen. Did you not think this through? But there was that group of people that immediately wanted to criticize, that, that wanted to find fault. I'm sure we know people like that in our lives, that no matter what, you know, there's no such thing as a good thing, right? No matter what good news you can bring, boy, they can find some kind of fault in it somewhere, they can discover it. And so how these people are, are now criticizing, they're trying to find fault, they're trying to figure out something, because by now, uh, people are taking sides. You either hate them or you love them. And the group that hates him is growing. So they begun criticizing him. And then this other group there, uh, you know, they go and they, they're like, well, that was great, but we want to see a greater miracle. We want to see something better. What else can you do, right? More of a, of a circus act. Well, that was good, but what, what other things can you do for me? What else can you... Dude, you know, I mean, the Old Testament prophets, you know, they were able to cast fire from, from heaven, right? And then some saw manna coming down from heaven. God sent that. And, boy, we've seen, you know, Moses hit a rock and water came out. There was all these other miracles. I mean, that was pretty good, Jesus, but we want to see more. We want to see something. Impress us. Impress us. The section begins by saying, while these crowds were thickly gathered together, you know, these gatherings are getting bigger and there are more people. And as they're in the middle of this, Jesus then says to them, this is an evil generation. I can think about it. He just, look what he just did for this person. And nobody cared about the person. Nobody was thinking about the person nobody was looking at. Even we've seen that several times already that when Jesus did something great for someone, they overlook it. Like when uh, the man at the temple, right? And they were concerned about, oh, today's the Sabbath. Now, wow, look what you did for him. And Jesus looks at him and says, you know, this is such an evil generation. It seeks a sign, but guess what? No sign is going to be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. 
Again, these people wanted more. Give me more, give me more, show me more, show me more, show me more. Always wanted a miracle, always wanted a miracle, always wanted another sign. Wanting more, more, more. Jesus says, look, you guys are so wicked. There's not going to be a sign. Except that of Jonah. Now, if you know the story of Jonah, right? God calls Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh. Now, Nineveh, the Ninevites, okay, were extremely brutal people. I mean, they committed atrocities on the people of God. They were just, they would go, if they conquered uh, a town or a village, uh, they would decimate it from raping to killing the kids to putting the men on spikes. I mean, they didn't just defeat you. Uh, they were really brutal. These were the worst of the worst. And most scholars believe that probably someone that Jonah loved, some kind of family member or something, had been brutalized because Jonah was like, there's no way I'm going there to preach the word. There's no way I'm going to do that. Why? Because the last thing I want is any of them. I want, the last thing I want to do is see any of them in heaven. There's not one of them I want to run into in heaven. I'm not going. And he runs from God. And God, of course, takes him. Deals with him. As a matter of fact, he was willing to give his life. I'd rather die than preach to those people. Right? Jumps in the water and God says, man, you ain't going to die, bro. <laughs> You're going to do exactly what I said. Giant fish grabs him, spits him on the land, and says, Daddy, get back to work, John. So Jonah goes into this town into the city of wickedness, of evil, of debauchery, the worst of the worst. He goes into that town and begins to preach. And he's saying, hey, tick tock, tick tock, God is bringing, bringing destruction. You have so many days and God is going to destroy the city. So what was the miracle of Jonah? I'm sure the your first law was the fish, right? Anybody? You thought the fish was the miracle, right? But that's not the miracle. Because nobody in Nineveh knew about the fish. <laughs> the miracle was that all these wicked, evil people listened to the word of God and repented. They all repented. The worst of the worst. How many times in your life have you thought, that person will never accept Christ? You ever know anybody like that? That you were like, there's no way. There's no way that person. Has there ever been, ever been someone in your life that you thought, I wouldn't want to reckon that person in heaven. I wouldn't want that person to receive the grace of God. I'm sure we can think of somebody. I'm sure we think of the annals of history. There are people that we go, uh-uh. We definitely don't want them to receive Christ. Right? Come on. Come on, people. Preach. Right? We can all think of people that we go, uh, -uh I hope not. I hope not. And that's where Jonah was. But Jonah goes out there and, and Jesus says, this is a wicked generation. And there's not going to be a sign except the sign of Jonah. The prophet, for as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. You want a sign? I am the sign. Jesus is saying, I am the sign. What sign are you looking for? You are standing before the presence of holiness. You are in the presence of God Almighty and you want a sign? Verse 31, he says, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Queen of the south, better known as the queen of Sheba, when she heard 
about the power of God through King Solomon and the wisdom that God gave Solomon and how God had blessed Solomon. She said, I've got to go see this guy. And she went all the way, she traveled all the way to Israel and sat there and spent time with Solomon. And she turned to the God of Israel because she saw what God had done in his life. I couldn't help it. I know I've shared my, my testimony before. You know, uh, my mom was one of those that had wanted to have nothing to do. She, she hated religion. You know, she had been so discouraged. She had seen so much junk in, in the religious world. She was so anti-religion that we couldn't speak to her about it. And the reason my mother came to the Lord was not because of what we said to her, but it was because she saw Christ in us, myself and Miriam. Because her seeing Christ in us is what turned her life around. And she gave her heart to Christ because of that, not because of the words that came out of our mouth. And sometimes the greatest testimony that we have is to live out Christ in our lives. That is the powerful testimony. And so Jesus here says, man, you guys are a wicked, wicked generation. And all you're asking for is a sign. You criticize, you judge, and now you want a sign? It's not going to be a sign. But Jonah went out, and what was the sign? The sign was the word of God. That's all they had was the word of God. And they all repented by hearing the word of God. They believed. They repented of their ways. You got a queen, a national leader, who repented and came to the Lord just by seeing what God had done in the life of someone else. And you have someone that is greater than that queen in front of you. You have someone who's greater than Jonah in front of you. You have a living Messiah in your midst, and you're asking for a sign. See, because for some people, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. He said, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. As we went through the book of Revelation, we saw the destruction that's coming. If you think that was an evil generation, think of it. Jesus said to them, you are an evil generation because you not only have the Old Testament prophets, but you have the Messiah right here, and you still don't believe. So those, those evil Ninevites will stand in judgment of you. The very Queen of Sheba will stand in judgment of you of you but think about this generation we have today the generation today not only had the Old Testament prophet not only did we have the, the death the, the life death resurrection of Jesus Christ but we're on this side of it where we have God's completed word remember they didn't have a Bible we have all revelation. And yet we see a wicked generation. And we're seeing more and more wickedness all around us, in this country and around the world. Things are changing. And again, I brought up revelation because as we study it, you know, you, you see and you wonder why. Why so much destruction? Why, why so much pain? Why so much suffering? 
And the answer is because the wickedness increases and increases and increases. And Jesus said, listen, those people who repented will stand in judgment of you. They will stand in judgment of you because they only had a little bit of revelation and they turned their lives around and they changed. And you have had complete revelation. And now us on this side of the cross, we have even more revelation. We have full revelation and we're still seeing generation after generation becoming more and more wicked. And, and what's coming is, is awful. The judgment is real, and the judgment is awful. I mean, it just goes from bad to worse to worse to worse. And, and you wonder how much can they endure. But even so, even so, we read about the millennial reign of Christ. And so the, after the, the, the war, the Armageddon, and, and Christ comes down with his saints and, and and come and, and take over. And for a thousand years, there's total peace. Satan is, is tossed into the pit, and he's in there, and he's bound up, and he's out of here. And there's, there's peace on earth, and, and everybody is living in the very light of Christ. And we find out that God loosens Satan for a time, and when Satan comes back, there's another rebellion from people who are living in the midst of Christ and they rebel. It's, it's mind boggling. <coughs> Excuse me. It's mind boggling. The evil and wickedness. And the wickedness that every one of us is capable. What keeps us from the wickedness is the very presence of God in our lives. Amen? Is the Holy Spirit in us that allows us to, to live a life, to put Christ first, which is what Jesus basically says next, because then he says, you know, no one when he has a lamp puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. Christ is the light of the world. And he's saying, well, who, who lights a lamp? I don't know, no FPNL back then. <laughs> who lights a lamp and then covers it with a basket? Well, nobody will do that because the whole point of the light is to illuminate, right? And we, we are called to be the light of the world. Amen? Amen? So we are to shine. That is the point of Christ in us. The Holy Spirit in us is so that we could be this light. Why? Because we live in a time and a generation that is wicked. And what's coming is awful. And Christ, for some reason, God chose us to make the difference, we are called to bring that light to illuminate Christ to others. And he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Uh, the eye is symbolic of our soul, of our spirit. See, with Christ, the light shines in us. But without Christ, there is nothing but darkness. There is nothing but darkness. And, and that's Satan's job, is to keep you in darkness, to keep everyone in darkness, to try to prevent people from hearing the word. And though uh, Satan cannot... Uh, come in us because we have the Holy Spirit he often manipulates us and the greatest manipulation that, that Satan can use is to put a basket on your light and the basket is simple keep you so busy 
that you can do nothing for Christ. Amen? Right? Keep you so busy in your life, doing, 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 having, 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 that just living life, living life, living life, that your light is basically, yeah, you have a light, but Satan was able to put a basket over it. Nobody sees it. Nobody sees it. You're not reflecting Christ to anyone. You're not illuminating salvation unto others. We're not being, and if you notice, Luke, throughout this book, has been heavy on discipleship and the, what, the, the cost of being a disciple. It's going to cost you something, okay? If it hasn't cost you anything, then you need to rethink, you know, am I really a disciple? Am I really following Christ? Again, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about a, the difference between a wasted life for Christ and, and a, a, a life that actually was used in a mighty way. See, because God wants to do a miracle, but the miracle he wants to do is like that of Jonah. A miracle is when us, who are sinful people, are able to shine a light in a dark person and light that person, that that person turns to Christ and now you get that flicker and then we're called to what? To fan that flame, to get it, to get them fired up for the Lord and then to do the same. Uh, that's our calling. And each one has different talents and different ways of doing it. We're all different and God uses us. That's why Paul talks about the body of Christ and you know, some of us are fingers and hands and toes and eyes and hair and ears. You know, we're all different. We all have our unique way that we can communicate and light, light up the world. And that's why Jesus finishes off by saying, therefore, take heed, take heed. Okay, take heed. He's saying, watch it. That the light which is in you is not darkness. What? If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Take heed. You might think... <laughs> You might think that you're all lit up, but you're in total darkness. That's one of the scariest thoughts, amen? It's like that verse. One day, they'll come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we heal people in your name? Lord, Lord. Didn't we do this and that in your name? Lord, Lord, and I will say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. You did all that for yourself. That's a scary proposition, amen? amen. That is a scary proposition. And he says here, therefore, therefore, because of everything I just said, because we live in a dangerous time, because we live in a wicked generation, be careful that the light in you is really light because if it's really light, your whole body will be lit up. In other words, if you really have Christ in you, if you're really the light of Christ and the light of the world, you will be shining. People will see it. There's absolutely no way that you can shine a light and nobody sees it. Still be careful because if nobody sees your light, there not, might not be any light at all. Do not deceive yourself. It's, it's a hard thing, especially perhaps for those who might just be watching online. Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? I mean, really, do you know that you know that you know that you can remember the day you did it? If not, let me encourage you to do it right now. 
All you have to do is in faith say, Lord God, I want you in my life. I want the light of Jesus Christ in my heart. And I will live for you from this day forward. Because there is no magic in the prayer. It's about faith. Believing that Christ died for our sins and rose again and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. If you believe that and pray that, you ask God, God is faithful and just. He will forgive you of all your sins. He will come into your life. You will become a new creation in him. But that's just the flicker. We have to fan the flame. And we are all called to light the world up. Heck, we need to set the world on fire, amen? Amen. amen. So let's go ahead and bow for a time of prayer right now.